Hello, everybody, um, and thanks for joining us. My name is Bob Fryatt. I'm the project director for the Local Health Systems and Sustainability Project. Um, today, we're going to have a presentation, uh, a discussion around domestic resource mobilization, country strategies to enhance health funding in normal times and in times of crisis. We're in the midst of a global COVID-19 pandemic, and countries all around the world are struggling to finance their changing needs in health whilst protecting livelihoods and protecting their broader societal and economic needs. Now more than ever, we need to learn from different experiences on domestic resource mobilization and how the, the international community can work with countries to support sustainable solutions as they move progressively towards universal health coverage. Today, we have two presentations and then panel discussion. The first presenter is um, Esu Demisi, um, who's a health economist for, um, working on the USAID Ethiopia Health Financing Improvement Program. Um, and he will talk about experience in Ethiopia. We then have Andre Zida, um, who's a health economist who results for development. Um, and he will discuss or present um, some experiences from Cote d'Ivoire. That will be followed by um, Cheryl Cashin, who is the Managing Director for Results for Development, who will talk about um, the domestic resource mobilization and in the, in the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. Look forward to the discussion. We'll have a, then have a panel discussion, um, and we will um, I look forward to that. If you have any questions that arise during the presentations or later on, please use the chat box, um, and they will be used to put to the panel uh, later in the latter half of the, of the session. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Esu. Esu, over to you. Thank you so much. The Health Financing Improvement Program has conducted a study on exploring options for increasing physical space for health and care. Next slide, please. Let me give you a general background of the overall macroeconomic and health sector of the country. Ethiopia has registered the highest economic growth over the last three decades. So real GDP on average has grown by 7.5% over the last 28 years. The share of tax revenue from GDP has averaged out 11.5% in the last 18 years. Recently, in 2018, uh, this tax share was 13.5%. On the other hand, regarding challenges, the country's overall government debt is growing from time to time, and it has reached 65% of GDP. The economy is also challenged by high inflation and a difficult balance of payments. Next slide, please. The health sector in Ethiopia is a government priority. It's one of the pro-poor sectors. However, compared to other pro-poor sectors like education, water and sanitation, agriculture and roads, the health sector has historically been less prioritized in terms of sharing government budgets. Looking at the general government expenditure for health as a percentage of total government expenditure, the share is less than 9% over the last 10 years. This average share is also less than the health sector transformation plan of 10% by 2020. When we look into the recently conducted national uh, health accounts landscape, we find that per capita health expenditure is around USD 33. And 35% of the total health expenditure is coming from the rest of the world, 32% from government, and 31% from households in the form of out of pocket payment. So, in order to deal with this relatively high out of pocket payment, the Ethiopian government started to implement community-based health insurance in 2011, and it is uh, being operational in more than 500 districts or orders, and is benefiting more than 24 million people. However, CBHI has remained to be decentralized and fragmented at the district or order level. In addition, there is no cross-subsidization between districts. Next slide, please. So, the major objectives of conducting the review of physical space are first, to consolidate and synthesize the existing evidence on 
domestic resource mobilization and physical space for the health sector. And second, to create evidence base of feasible sources of finance. That is to identify promising, realistic, and practical options of increasing physical space for the health sector at the federal level. So as a methodology, we used the five pillars framework developed by Karshan and Tanda. Next slide, please. As illustrated in the table, uh, most sources of physical space, that is four out of five, indicate that there is a moderate potential for the government to provide additional budgetary resources for the health sector. Moderate in the sense that the assessed options or sources or pillars of physical space could present an average amount of revenue or benefits in the short to medium term period. For example, when we look at the first source or option, that the macroeconomic conditions, we reviewed evidence that supports and creates conducive economic environment for further budgetary resources for health. So the major ones are real GDP growth rate, the country has registered the likelihood of the economy to leverage up on the recently launched homegrown economic reform blueprint and the promising performance of the economy according to the IMF study. This is according to the IMF study uh, in the coming years. However, the economy is also challenged by high inflation and high debts, of course, including a challenging balance of payments. Taking all these and other evidences, both opportunities and challenges together and synthesizing them, the potential for the first source or option to generate additional budgetary resources for health is believed to be moderate. Regarding the second source, that is the prioritization of health in government budget, the evidence reviewed indicates a moderate potential. The fact that the health is a government priority, but less priority within the proper sectors, and government spending on health is below 9%, and the federal budget allocation of the health sector, 5% in 2018. And on the other hand, considering government's commitment to increase, you know, government spending on health to 10% by 2020, all these evidences indicate uh, a moderate potential for the government to increase additional budgetary resources for health from this source. Similarly, the potential for the third and the fifth options, that is health sector specific resources and efficiency, are also believed to be moderate. On the other hand, external resources, the fourth option or source, is believed to have high potential in providing additional budgetary room for the sector. Although donor assistance is becoming more uncertain these days, and the rate of growth of official development assistance is declining over time, it is believed to contribute more resources for the sector in the coming short to medium term period. For example, the official development assistance for health has decreased from around 571 million US dollars in 2013-14 to 323 million US dollars in 2016-17. And the most Significant donor transitions, example, PFAR, uh, GFATM, it reduced funding by more than 50% since 2012. Similar trend is also expected from other development partners. But still, the source will have high potential. Next slide, please. So finally, what conclusion and recommendation can we draw from this review? First, the evidence reviewed indicate that the resources allocated to the health sector have not been proportional to the registered economic growth of the country. And second, overall, the country will have a moderate physical space to finance the health sector in the short to medium term. And third, as a recommendation, of course, it is also necessary for the country to conduct political economy analysis to identify challenges and opportunities to increasing domestic resource mobilization for health because political economy analysis will help us to identify uh, the general factors driving or blocking reform. Thank you so much. Thanks very much indeed. Um, 
very interesting. We've all seen great things happen in Ethiopia over the last 10 years, but clearly from the slides, we can see that there's going to be some um, difficult um, times ahead, and uh, it's good to see that um, this analysis is taking place. We can come back to some of the points you raised in the discussion, and please, to those listening, please send in your any questions you have for, for ESU. We'd like to move now over to Cote d'Ivoire and um, and hear about experiences there. And I'd like to hand over to Andre Z. Andre, over to you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, this presentation. So this morning, we'll be looking at uh, domestic resource mobilization for HIV funding sustainability in Cote d'Ivoire. Next slide. So uh, since the first HIV case notification in Cote d'Ivoire, the government implemented uh, a various strategy to reverse the epidemic curve, uh, among which we have uh, the test and treat uh, strategy that has uh, been implemented recently in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, free ARV treatment for people living with HIV, for example. So as a result, as you can see in these two figures, the new HIV infection curve has started reverse since uh, 1990, and uh, also the mortality is still going down. So the decrease, for example, for HIV incidence from 2010 to 2018 was uh, 32%. The decrease for the HIV death from 2010 to 2018 is also around 35, 34%. We also have a significant decrease in uh, uh, HIV prevalence among pregnant women. For example, from 2014 to 2019, we have a decrease from 2% to 0.7%. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, uh, funding for HIV in the country, so these slides came from uh, compiled data from the health account data. Uh, from uh, uh, 2011 to 2018, 2018 being the last years of uh, the health account uh, data in, in study in Cote d'Ivoire. So as a result, as you can see in this figure, since 2013 to 2018, we have uh, 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 the, the HIV funding has doubled uh, from 100 million US dollar to around 205 million dollar. Next slide, please. So who are the main key contributors to the HIV funding uh, in Cote d'Ivoire? So uh, from this figure, we, this figure is showing that uh, uh, the HIV uh, uh, source of funding we have, in terms of HIV source of funding, we have three main contributors. Uh, and uh, an average from 2011 to 2018, uh, around 92% of the HIV funding came from three main sources. And the first uh, source of funding is uh, PEPFAR, uh, uh, around 63% of the total spending, followed by Global Fund, 16%, and then the government uh, state budget around 12% uh, of the Total spending. As uh, you can see in this figure, this has an issue of uh, funding sustainability. Since this uh, global fund and PEPFA are the main source of funding, and uh, the total contribution for these uh, two funding source of funding is really high uh, compared to the Cote d'Ivoire government contribution. But since 2014, the government is uh, making a lot of effort to increase its contribution to the HIV funding uh, using various strategies to increase domestic resource mobilization. Next slide, please. So uh, then what are the strategies that the Cote d'Ivoire has put in place to increase uh, the domestic resource mobilization to uh, address the issue that we explained in the previous slides. Uh, the Cote d'Ivoire uh, has established a single unit called uh, Front National de Lutte contre le SIDA, FNLS, uh, which is a single unit in the, in the country to uh, 
you know, for HIV uh, domestic resource mobilization. And they are mainly using uh, various strategy, as we all know, uh, through the HIV, uh, through the domestic resource mobilization. First, they, they, they have taxes uh, on around uh, for tobacco. They also sell solid, solidarity stamps. They also sell uh, loin cloth and fundraising through different strategy when they have uh, different events in the country. They also have, in the country has, we, 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 we all know they have two type of state budgets in Cote d'Ivoire HIV uh, response. The first budget is the uh, state budget line for the HIV program, which is mainly for the program implementation, also paying salaries for the program. And the second uh, Cote d'Ivoire state budget contribution is what is called global fund co-financing, which is around 15 to 20 percent of global, uh, global fund contribution, meaning that any time global fund provides a, uh, a certain amount of, uh, of money for the HIV response in country, the country also has to come up with uh, a co-funding and uh, for the new, the new, uh, uh, new funding uh, model, the contribution co funding is around 20%. Uh, another strategy is what is also called evidence-based state budget allocation, which means they are right now conducting uh, a costing uh, using most of the key evidence-based strategy, uh, implementing a uh, strategy around key population the century that I was talking about, and also other various uh, uh, strategies. So the current discussion in the country is around uh, uh, trying to use the Caisse Nationale d'Assurance Maladie, which is uh, uh, the universal health coverage mechanism in the country. So the discussion is to include different or uh, some HIV intervention in the, in the Caisse Nationale d'Assurance Maladie to support the funding. And that will also increase domestic resource mobilization as a strategy through the universal health coverage. Next slide, please. So uh, through this initiative, uh, R4D has a, a US state uh, project is also supporting the country for domestic resource mobilization. So, uh, uh, in, in, in the project is planning to support the Fondation Abdulit uh, FNLS roundtable to uh, with a meeting with stakeholders to support uh, domestic resource mobilization, which will also include a uh, private sector and various contributors to the HIV funding. We are also supporting uh, uh, through the project evidence-based budget, budget allocation with the new funding. Uh, strategy and the new HIV strategy that the country is currently working on. The project are for the also through the USA project is also supporting uh, the HIV subgroup discussion on drafting an HIV funding sustainability roadmap with uh, a clear milestone. So the study is still going on and uh, all this discussion is uh, still going on in the country. I think this is my, uh, the last slide. Thank you. Andre, thank you so much indeed. Very interesting. Um, yes, it's what we see in Cote d'Ivoire, we're seeing in many, so many other countries this, um, over the last decade, this incredible response to HIV AIDS, which has been so successful in many ways. But as you can see, a lot of it's still coming from international funding sources. So um, some, some difficult uh, road ahead. So very interesting to see what's happening in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, so please, to all of you, um, listening, please put in your questions on the chat box um, and we'll be going through those and putting them back to a, a panel discussion for Esu and Andre um, later on. Um, and now I'd like to invite Cheryl to um, make some reflections about domestic resource mobilization in the time of a crisis such as the COVID-19. Cheryl, over to you. Thank you very much, Bob, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And also thank you to the presenters um, for setting the stage with that really great overview of the situation in both Ethiopia and Cote d'Ivoire. 
And I think we saw in both cases that domestic resource mobilization is a challenge uh, for low and middle income countries in general. And now with the COVID-19 pandemic, the crisis response and looking ahead to the recovery, we're gonna be facing some, some new and possibly deeper challenges. So I wanted to reflect a little bit on what's happening in those countries um, related to the response to COVID-19, how that relates to domestic resource mobilization for them, and some general points that I think other low and middle income countries might, might consider. So obviously the, the COVID-19 pandemic is really, is um, just, is such a threat to domestic resource mobilization from two sides. I think one is the expanded needs, obviously, in the health sector to, to respond to the pandemic and to look ahead to recovery, but also the economic collapse that, that some countries are facing, at least in the short term. So um, what, what's really happening and, and what can countries do to prepare and protect, especially protecting continuity of essential services through the response and the recovery? Um, if we look at, at both Cote d'Ivoire and Ethiopia, both of these countries saw their first cases of COVID-19 in March, and both of them responded very swiftly with um, containment measures, and they, they put resources behind them very quickly. So in both countries, they allocated a substantial emergency fund to the health sector um, to, to deal with the pandemic response. In the case of Cote d'Ivoire, it was about 0.3% um, of GDP going to this, the health portion of the response, which is, was quite significant. And in Ethiopia, an emergency fund to the health sector of 0.15% of GDP. So both countries mobilized resources very quickly um, to, to shore up the health sector, but then they mobilized even more resources for, for um, stabilizing the economy and supporting some of the other sectors. And, and quite, a, quite a bit more went to those parts of economic support packages. So where do these resources come from and what is going to mean for domestic resource mobilization for health? Um, both of the countries have a combination of deficit spending to generate these resources and also additional donor funding. So deficit spending is a source of fiscal space that we don't often talk about for health, but certainly in a time of crisis, it's, it's a very um, necessary and, and appropriate step. So these countries have acted decisively and they have avoided, I think for now, the, the worst case scenario of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as of the latest data, there are 1,900 cases in Cote d'Ivoire with 24 deaths in Ethiopia, 263 cases and five deaths. So, so this response being swift um, has, has at least kept the worst case scenario at bay. But let's, let's talk about what this means for funding continuity of, of essential services um, at this time and in the future. We know from the Ebola outbreak that the consequences on morbidity and mortality can be higher even for non-pandemic non, um, related causes in these times. And so protecting the continuity of essential services is, is quite critical. So in the response period, this means, I think, what we've seen from some other countries is making a very clear and explicit plan for maintaining the continuity of essential services and, and how that will be funded. Even if some health spending is being diverted and reallocated to the pandemic response, what is the plan for maintaining essential services and how will that continue to be funded? But as we look ahead to the recovery, I think there are, there are three points that we're observing countries um, looking at it and what they'll have to keep in mind as they look ahead to the impact of the pandemic on domestic resource mobilization for health. So the first is what is going to happen to the longer term prospects of these economies and overall fiscal space and the ability of, of the countries to recover what we've seen, at least for Cote d'Ivoire and Ethiopia, these are considered to be quite robust economies, at least prior to the pandemic. There is some prediction that they will be resilient and bounce back relatively quickly. Um, we, we can hope that that is the case. Um, there are some predictions that because the, the way that economic growth has happened in both countries has focused on the fundamentals that, that they will be able to recover. But in any case, there will probably need to be some fiscal consolidation to deal with the deficit spending for the response. So how that impacts on social sector spending is, is really 
going to, um, I think, to have a lot of reliance on the second point, and that is the prioritization in the budget for health. And we know that we saw from, from both Esu's and Andre's presentation that the priority of health in the budget hasn't always been robust in these countries. I think under 9% in Ethiopia of total government spending goes to health, and even less in Cote d'Ivoire, it's more like 5%. So I think it's time already for the health sector officials to be sitting down with ministries of finance, looking ahead to the recovery with, with, with these massive um, spending plans to support the, the economies during the pandemic crisis. What is that going to do to the long-term priority for health in the budget? Is, is there going to be a plan to, to make sure that it doesn't continue to get crowded out? And looking at the example that Andre shared from Cote d'Ivoire, having evidence-based plans to take to budget discussions what what was really needed to protect essential services over, over the medium term and, and what are the resource requirements for that. But I think the third point I want to make is, is really about address taking this opportunity to address some of the structural inefficiencies in health sector resource allocation and, and expenditures, taking the opportunity to address some of those structural issues so that even if there are reallocations away from health in the short term, that the funds that are available are used most effectively. And looking at issues of fragmentation, I think in both countries, there's a lot of fragmentation in, in different um, revenue sources for health, where they're going. Essential services are funded in different ways and maybe taking this opportunity to consolidate a bit and, and use those funds more effectively. Looking at issues of decentralization, can, can some of the fragmentation that is caused by decentralization be, be addressed now so that resources can be allocated more, more equitably, but also more efficiently. And I'm thinking of the community-based health insurance scheme in Ethiopia. It is highly decentralized now, and I think they've really reached the limit of what they can do in, in that fragmented financing scheme, and maybe now is an opportunity to look um, at, at harmonizing and, and consolidating possibly more in that scheme at the national level. And another structural issue that the, this pandemic actually creates an opportunity to address is multi-sectoral strategies and budgeting. Can we look now at this opportunity to look at social protection, nutrition, health in a broader lens and estimate resources required to, to improve those services more holistically and take a multi-sectoral view so that we don't stay in the situation where health is continuing, always competing with other sectors but rather in a more multi-sectoral harmonized way to address the needs of the population in, in that way. So I'd like to stop there and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Cheryl, thank you very much indeed. That was excellent um, and very stimulating. Um, so we, we're getting some questions in, so I'm um, going to pass them over. We're going to move on now to have a, a panel discussion. Um, and we may also be joined, so we have Esu, Andre, and Cheryl. We may also be joined by Benjamin Picillo from the RFD as well for the, for the, for the panel discussion. So um, I've got a few questions here. Um, I'll go through them for the different panelists, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll go over to the, to the panel. So first of all, for Ben on uh, Ethiopia. Um, with the state selling off a number of companies, the private sector is growing. Is there any contribution from the private sector for the health sector, for its employees, or its uh, corporate social responsibility? And what about the health care in the private sector? I read for all the questions. That's for Ben. For Andre on Cote d'Ivoire, I've got two questions. Um, is the Cote d'Ivoire tobacco tax earmarked for HIV AIDS um, or for the health sector? If the former, does it does not inherently limit the flexibility of the Ministry of Health to respond in an integrated way to infectious disease, especially in the COVID-19 context. Andre, another one for you in Cote d'Ivoire. Do you have other funding sources in Cote d'Ivoire, such as from communities? And then the last question I'll give now, is Cheryl, that perhaps is for you. Um, given the fiscal constraints that we've been hearing about, how can donor partners and global funding facilities, and we heard about Pet Farm Global Fund, how can they best support low-income countries on the best strategy to improve domestic resource mobilization. So we'll start off with Ben. Over to you for that first question. Ben, 
Thanks, Bob. Um, so I think the, the question of the potential of, of additional um, resource mobilization through the private sector in Ethiopia um, is something that um, ESU and, and others who had worked on this analysis did consider. Um, I think generally um, looking at domestic in, um, sources of domestic innovative financing is something that has been considered as part of the overall um, health sector transformation plan as well as the um, more recent healthcare financing strategy within Ethiopia. I think even with the growing size of the private sector, there, um, you know, I think our limits in terms of the, the both the, the size and feasibility of resources that could be mobilized through things such as corporate social responsibility. Um, and, and I think in terms of um, those sources not necessarily being the most sustainable in the long run. And I think, um, you know, when we look more broadly at some of the issues that both Esu and Cheryl raised within the Ethiopian context of a fragmentation of, of different financing schemes as well as the, the community-based health insurance scheme right now, um, you know, I think something to, to consider more broadly would be, you know, what are ways of which um, there could be broader private sector engagement in, in thinking through the redesign and harmonization of those schemes as well, given um, there's already a fairly low level of private voluntary health insurance um, within the country. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Ben, thanks very much. Um, okay, Andre, over to you. The questions around Cote d'Ivoire and um, tobacco tax and, and community sources. Andre. Yes, uh, thank you, Bob. So. Uh, as I mentioned in the in the presentation, the the Fund National, the uh, the FNLS is mainly a unit in the country that uh, usually uh, try to raise uh, additional funding for HIV uh, uh, in the country. So mainly, what they have in their strategy document is that uh, the tobacco taxes, uh, when they raise funding through the tobacco taxes, is mainly allocated to uh, HIV. It's because that's what they have has a mandate for them uh, for, 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 for the strategy. So all these funding rates are mainly allocated to the HIV. But what we don't know is uh, what, how this is really uh, working in the country because looking at their data since when they started in 2014 or 16, I think, uh, 14, so uh, the budget was, uh, uh, the unit was able to raise a significant amounts, but since then it's uh, uh, decreasing a little bit and probably that's part of the reason why they are planning to conduct a round table to uh, uh, increase uh, uh, the domestic resource mobilization. So uh, the other question is around uh, having different source of funding for uh, HIV. So yes, looking at the national health account data, uh, the HIV, uh, uh, the program has uh, many sources of funding to uh, uh, contribute to the HIV in, in the country, but uh, uh, most of them, when you look at uh, the way they contribute, it's uh, uh, not, I would not say consistent, and uh, because when you you build the numbers, you you analyze the data and look at what are the rate and the ratio from their contribution, it's uh, really low, and uh, they are sometimes targeting a specific program and uh, specific intervention in the country. For example, when you look at uh, a contribution from uh, World Bank, we also have contribution from. Uh, uh, UNICEF or also from some of the uh, in-country companies. So those funding also contribute to the HIV in uh, funding in, 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 in the country. I think there is another another question, Bob, could you remind the second question that you asked? Yes, Andre, is, the question was, um, what about the um, sources within the communities? Are the communities another source? Of funding. Uh, when you say community, do you mean uh, uh, household contribution? I am assuming that's what they meant by that. Yes. Uh, it's 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 really low because uh, uh, currently R4D uh, 
uh, is supporting a, a user fee study in the country to understand how this, uh, uh, the household is contributing to the HIV. But in the regulation uh, uh, in 2014, the country issued uh, a regulation whereby uh, facility are not allowed anymore to charge user fee to, uh, uh, for patients coming for HIV treatment in the country. So officially, there is a regulation that not allow unit to charge for HIV expenses. But in reality, when we look at the data, there are still some units that uh, are still charging for HIV uh, 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 treatment in, in some facilities. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Um, over to Cheryl now for the question about uh, the role of international financing partners and global fund, etc. Cheryl, over to you. Thank you, Bob, for that question. I think, um, you know, the, the economic reality that what we're seeing and what the recovery is going to look like, I think the first point is that the donors need to realize that they are going to need to be part of this for a long time and that they, um, now is not the time to be, to be for accelerating maybe transition away from donor funding. Maybe now is not the time to be really putting pressure on the, this move towards self-reliance too quickly. I think they should acknowledge that this funding is going to be needed. And, and, and maybe extend some of those time horizons a bit. I also think that the donors need to be thinking about flexibility, um, the funding that they are providing. Can they be a bit more flexible so that this, this money can be used as it is needed in the response and in the recovery? Can it be a little bit more flexible so that it could be a way to get funds to frontline health providers um, more quickly? So what can, can the donors do to ease some of their earmarking constraints right now and conditionalities uh, and some of the requirements? Um, that, that might be a, a way that they could, could help with, with the, the, just the, the flexibility that's needed to get funds into the systems and get the funds to where they're most needed. I also think that the, the donors should be thinking about how they can be supportive to build back better. You know, what can they do to support some of these other, other points that I raised previously? Um, can they help to support more multi-sectoral responses? We know that, that donors often program their money according to sectoral lines. There's health programming, education program, social protection programming. Um, can they also look at, across and be a bit more multi-sectoral in, in the kinds of support that they're giving? And can they help to make some of these investments to, to reduce the fragmentation in the health financing in some of the countries um, rather than contributing to it, but really help with the investment. So I, I think those are the points that, that I would like to, to think, have the donors to, to be considering at this moment. Cheryl, thanks very much indeed. Um, okay, so the questions come in thick and fast. A um, couple more for Ben. And by the way, I'll just say that Ben is talking on behalf of ESSU. ESSU we had a few questions. So Ben, who worked closely with ESSU, is standing in to take some of the questions. Um, so Ben, back to Ethiopia. Um, in in the in Esu's um, presentation, he talked about um, uh, the external resources having a high potential in Ethiopia. But how can you justify this with all the COVID response and also his own reflection that current um, uh, project, uh, current amounts have been going down recently? Thanks, Bob. Um, so I think it's a, a good point and, and, and one, um, you know, to note of, that this analysis was completed um, prior to, to the current COVID pandemic, um, but I think it's a good question regardless. Um, in terms of, you know, many of the points that Cheryl had just made of, of um, you know, that this isn't necessarily the time when, when donors are necessarily considering of how to accelerate transitions or um, necessarily lead to, um, you know, reduce aid. But I do think, um, you know, there's a serious consideration over, um, you know, how this pandemic is affecting the ways in which we work and what um, ability, um, you know, donors have and in, in, in supporting partners have in, in um, providing um, assistance and, and support to countries in order to further some of these larger ambitious health financing goals that they have. Um, so I do think, um, you know, it, it, within the Ethiopian context, there is a, you know, sort of an understanding that there, there would continue to be external support for Ethiopia, um, but that there's, 
a very important consideration that needs to be at the forefront of, of all of the other dimensions of potential domestic resources that um, need to be to be put in the forefront of the discussions. Okay, thanks for that. Um, and then keeping on, say, on Ethiopia for a moment, another question. Um, in Essie's presentation, you talked about how um, the, the role of community health insurance and how that hopes to expand. Um, but is and is the and he talks about government commitment. Um, but are you seeing strong government commitment to that? Um, and and do you think that this is um, realistic going forward with regard with their larger plans to get mobilised funds in the informal sector? Yes, I think um, in terms of um, the direction of of the CBHI program, um, I think you know there is a recognition recognition that um, given its more decentralized structure and the fragmentation that um, that type of, of system has created, um, that there's a, a need to look broadly at, at sort of a higher national level of, of what um, can be done to help reduce that fragmentation. Um, I think in terms of the, the overall goal of, of the CBHI program, again, is, is to provide financial risk protection. Um, and you know, while that can also be a source of mobilizing additional resources, um, you know, there's there's sort of a larger um, series of questions and and considerations that need to be um, thought through of of how do you really mobilize resources to expand coverage um, in a meaningful way that that helps advance um, those broader UHC goals. Thanks very much. Um, okay, over to Andre uh, on Cote d'Ivoire. Um, question around um, efficiencies. Um, you mentioned that in your in discussion, but is there much role do you see around technical efficiencies um, and integration of services and service delivery as a way of mobilizing additional resources um, in health? Um, and a, a link to that is uh, you, in, in your presentation, there were some fluctuations in funding over the years, and is that due to fluctuations in in, um, in, in government funding or through donor funding? Andre. Yes, thank you, Ben. Uh, no, so mainly the, the fluctuation is due to uh, some of the overall total contribution from donors uh, because the government's, the, the state budget plan is uh, uh, usually based on uh, historical budget allocation uh, for first uh, the program uh, budget line in, in the state budget. So they have current budgets uh, and uh, every year they keep it increasing from a certain percentage. But also uh, the another fluctuation coming from the state budget is around the uh, uh, global fund uh, contribution. As I said, it's based on co-funding. So meaning that if they have different contribution from a global fund, and the co-funding will be tied to this uh, 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 to the global fund contribution. It's going to probably at some point change the flow. So, but if, if you also look at uh, uh, the other funders' contribution coming from uh, uh, different partner like uh, World Bank or, or 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 bilateral contributor on HIV, uh, their funding is sometimes based on how the country is able to to sell the strategic plan and some of the strategy that they are planning to implement. So based on that, some of them sometimes provide support, but may not continue uh, uh, in the long term in terms of implementing the, uh, the support. So because these data start from 2011 up to 2018, which means we have a long period where we look at their contribution. Some donors may, may step in, with some support for two or three years, and then after that, another donor will come in. But I, the main key source of funding is a global fund, SEPFA, and the state budget line, which is really consistent over the years. Thank you. And Andre, about the in integration of services in the Cote d'Ivoire, is, is that a strategy? Are there other aimed at more efficient delivery? Oh yes, certainly yes, sure. Because uh, if you look at the uh, the new HIV strategy plan that the country is currently developing, and even through uh, the previous uh, uh, HIV strategic plans, 
there is a lot of uh, service integ integration going on because, uh, for example, for key population, if you look at how uh, uh, partners uh, and also uh, some of the units are implementing the service in the country, they sometimes uh, try to integrate the services and also through uh, mechanism through the uh, uh, second level of providers at the country level, hospitals, primary health care, and specific uh, units uh, dedicated to HIV service implementation. There is a lot of integration, service integration in the country. Even at the planning stage also, they also uh, try to involve most of the key players to uh, provide, uh, uh, to discuss the strategy and also go through some of the prioritization due to the funding and try to see which, which service or which strategy has uh, the best results and try to implement it. Andre, thanks. Um, Cheryl, over to you, if I may. Um, I mean, first of all, you may want to reflect on some of the other questions that have come up, um, but also there's a specific question that's come up around social health insurance. Um, and as you know, I mean, SHI has been, there's some, there's quite sort of uh, contentious about whether labor taxes are appropriate in, in, in some of these countries, but, um, but certainly with COVID, there'll be lots of job losses um, and there'll be a negative effect on, on contribution. So what do you think, um, is the uh, the role of social health, health insurance and has it been compromised going forward? Thanks for that question, Bob. And I think you know, sitting here in the United States, this this question has become very salient. D does it make sense to tie health coverage to employment and and pay for it with labor taxes? I think this is a question that you know a lot of us have have really been um, convinced that that connection doesn't make sense in in good economic times, but it really is quite detrimental in, in times of high unemployment and, and, and threats to, to the informal workers already. So I, I think that this is possibly a, a really important dialogue that we can have now in light of this pandemic, that can we move beyond this and really think much more, much more holistically about, about health coverage, universal health coverage, and delinking that from employment status or other life circumstances, that making it universal to really be universal. Um, so I'm hoping that this, this dialogue will, will continue in that direction across the world. Um, but also, I, I, I want to address this, what I think is really a myth that social health insurance is, is a, an untapped revenue source for health. You know, what we find is that it, it really, overall, Public spending on health is, is it's very fungible, and if you are earmarking a payroll tax, for example, it, it doesn't mean that that's going to be an additive resource for health, that it often displaces other budgetary resources. And we see sometimes in some countries that the reduction in budget funding after an earmarked tax is introduced is actually more. It's more than offsets that new revenue source. So, so I, I think, you know, both, both tying coverage to employment and thinking that that's an untapped revenue source are, are both myths that I hope we can use this pandemic crisis as an opportunity to dispel and move beyond. Cheryl, thanks very much for that. Um, so a question maybe for, um, for all, we'll go for all the all three of you um, one by one, but um, and it did come up in some of the discussions, but there's a question around, is COVID-19, how can we use this as an advocacy tool? I mean, is there, um, I mean, obviously it's a tragic, um, it's, tra it's a tragedy all around the world, um, but should we, is it also, can there be an opportunity there to uh, mobilize more resources, more fiscal space, not just for the health sector, but the, you know, across sectors, as was mentioned earlier on, um, for, as, as the needs going forward are gonna be so large. So is, are there any opportunities and any silver lining to this, this dark cloud? Um, maybe we'd, if we'll go through, so Ben, do you want to start off on that one? Sure, um, I think, um, you know, I, I definitely share your thoughts in, in terms of it, it being difficult to, to necessarily see a, a silver lining right at, at this moment in terms of the pandemic. Um, but I do think, um, you know, it, it in addition, um, you know, I, I think there is a need to, what this pandemic is doing is, is demonstrating 
um, you know, just how important public spending expenditures on health is, um, you know, in, in terms of all of the health system functions that need to be in place in order to both, um, you know, monitor the pandemic, but then also, um, you know, to to provide services um, that both are, are, are helping to to treat people with COVID, but also to maintain routine services in the same context. And in order to do that, I think there's um, quite an opportunity um, to make that case. Um, and I think there's, you know, further opportunity to design um, PH, PHC systems of the future. So really refocus our attention on primary level, the primary care level, um, you know, given its, its importance in, in providing those, those critical functions. Um, but also thinking about the larger efficiency gains that can be um, realized um, by refocusing um, at, at that level of the system. Thanks, Ben. Um, Andre, any reflections on this, on this topic? Yes. Uh, th thank you, Bob. I, I think right now uh, uh, it's a good timing to talk about how this country is uh, uh, facing or using uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic issue as an opportunity for them to uh, start the planning. So, you know, as you know, right now, the country is in the middle of uh, uh, developing the new HIV strategic plan. And then uh, uh, they are facing issue uh, working together as they used to develop their HIV strategic plan. So uh, with, within this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, context, the uh, uh, the stakeholders at the country level is now learning a new way of uh, uh, developing documents as they used to do it before because uh, oftentimes when they have to develop any document they usually have to uh, meet at the same place and have a, a deeper dive discussion with them and also try to this sometimes might not be uh, I would say uh, it, it could be efficient as they used to do it, but right now they are using a new way of developing documents, new way of discussing, new way of uh, meeting together, and sometimes uh, having a, a short team to develop uh, uh, the strategic document of some or some point in the document, and then finding a way to have people to contribute. So, in terms of funding uh, uh, contribution to the COVID-19 context. Uh, right now, we don't have e enough uh, data or, 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 or observation to uh, answer in terms of uh, funding contribution to uh, uh, in the context of uh, COVID-19. Over to you. Thanks very much indeed, um, Cheryl. Are you, you, met, you touched on this in your in your in your discussion, but anything else you'd like to say about this? Yeah, thanks, Bob. I mean, if this isn't Used as an opportunity to to make improvements in the systems, then, then it's really then it's just a tragedy. And I think we know often that progress on social issues can be made during times of crisis. So we have to make sure that the response is used as an opportunity to strengthen the underlying system. And we have good examples of that from Ebola. I think to really take that further, and we have the opportunity because so much of of addressing this pandemic has to happen at the community level. Can we really redefine the role of communities in the health sector and, and how their voices get, get brought in? Um, can we use this as an opportunity to address the structural inequities and vulnerabilities that are just so exposed in, in this time of crisis? And I think the, the reason that the answer to both of those questions might be yes is because with such an infectious disease, the political economy of, of universal health coverage changes, that we really see that we are only as protected as the most vulnerable person is protected. So it changes the politics, the political economy, and we might really be able to, to have a chance to, to get to true universality at, at this moment. And I, I really hope for that. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so the last, we've got the last few minutes. Um, one question again, maybe uh, for all three of you, but um, is around I mean, you're working, um, we work together on the local health system and sustainability project, one of you says um, big global projects on health systems strengthening. Um, and you do a lot of work in country on, on, on all these topics that you've been talking about in the last, uh, last hour. 
Um, but I'd like to ask ask you about um, what capacities um, are, are you see need, need, needing to be built in countries that aren't quite yet there, yet there. Uh, are there capacities in the ministries and governments or outside in, in universities that that to ultimately take over our role, the role that we're playing in um, working in, in, in many of these countries. So, and, and it did come out a little bit in some of the presentations earlier on, but can you talk a little bit about the longer term sustainability of this sort of work, this analysis and this discussion, the, the PEA analysis, that sort of thing? What do you think is required? What's lacking and needs to be built up? Um, and maybe we do it again in, in order. Um, ben, do you want to start off with talking about Ethiopia? Sure. So thanks, Bob. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, broadly, I think there's, you know, quite a, a you know, in terms of the capacity needs, there's a, a, a need to sort of look at the, you know, in terms of the the evidence to, to action cycle of what are, what analyses need to be completed, but then also, um, you know, what other systems research um, topics are, are needed to help inform um, technical decisions on reform. So I think in terms of capacities, um, you know, of, of really thinking about how do you um, identify local partners and, and work with them um, to be able to both generate the analytics, but then also use um, those analytics and engage in processes with key um, decision makers or policy makers um, in order to influence the broader direction of health reforms. Thank you. Andre, yes. Reflection Côte d'Ivoire. Yes, thank you, Bob. Uh, in, in terms of capacity right now, uh, I would say uh, the country currently is trying to, uh, as I said before, uh, uh, use new strategy or uh, also use evidence-based uh, uh, intervention implemented, implementation at the country level, and also involve most of the partners and uh, uh, NGOs and uh, 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 providers to first design what they are going to implement. And currently, as we know, uh, uh, most of the partners are more focused on evidence-based service implementation. That's why uh, uh, recently, USAID, uh, uh, PEPFA implemented, uh, uh, with the Cote d'Ivoire government, implemented the uh, uh, centric strategy, which uh, came up with uh, uh, strong results, but also uh, uh, having, building uh, 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 the service capacity to implement these services, at some point they have to strategize some uh, uh, service and uh, 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 intervention at the country level to come up with evidence-based results and also trying to uh, implement some of the, uh, you know, using uh, evidence to support services implementation. Uh, some of the ideas that we might be, uh, uh, we are still discussing with some of the uh, stakeholders and HIV program to see how best we can help them in terms of uh, 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 using evidence for service implementation. Uh, some countries have uh, uh, trained their workers to uh, uh, implement services like uh, 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 having a, a unit that or some team members that they will train, reinforce their capacity to help them pull out evidence to different database and summarize them for people who would like to use it for their service implementation. And this is something that we are still discussing as one-to-one -one with uh, some of the players at the country level and see how best this could be something that they will be interested and then uh, partner with them, build their capacity. And then if we see interest on it, we might see and discuss with USAID or UNAID at the country level to see how best we can, you know, come up with this type of uh, support to support their uh, team members. Andre, thanks. Right, we've come to the, um, the end of the, the time. Um, so I'm going to have to sort of wrap up. Um, and thank all our, our three, uh, our two presenters, um, and all our discussants, Cheryl and Ben. Um, it's been an excellent hour. I've learned a lot. So thank you so much for your time. I hope you all listening in have, have gained from this. Um, I think there are our contact details on these on the slides. And please get back to us if you have other questions. Um, and I hope it's been useful. And we look forward to any feedback.
and I look forward to discussing with many of you in many other forums going forward into the future. So thank you very much indeed.